It seems that uh, we are ready to start. And so I'm very happy to present Augusto Teixeira. He is going to start his mini course on quench multi scale renormalization. Uh, thank you, Augusto. And welcome to Oops. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the invitation. Um, yeah, as I said, I've was, been in Canada last time, 2017, and then my son came, pandemic came, and I didn't have the opportunity to go back again. I really wish you. this course was uh, back there and see so many uh, friends again. Um, but there we have it. It's great that we can meet across borders as well. Several people wouldn't be able to join if it was a in-person meeting. So thanks a lot. Uh, this course is going to have uh, three parts. I'm going to talk about them soon, but we'll um, two of them will be based on joint works with Marcelo Hilario, Hemi Sanchez, and Marcus Sa. Uh, and we, it's going to be clear what we talk about. But in the beginning, it's going to be very general. And even if you have no experience with uh, renormalization, this course should be uh, easy to follow, I guess. And please, if it's not, do ask questions. It's going to be in the best interest of me as well and everyone to have a course, especially since it's recorded, that is accessible and people can follow later on. So this is the basic structure. We're going to talk about uh, renormalization in general as a tool for percolation. Um, this is the today's lecture. And then we're going to have two lectures that talk about this more niche version of renormalization, which I decided to name quenched renormalization. And they have it has two flavors. I mean, this is a, a kind of arbitrary division I did between uh, this idea of good and bad boxes and uh, a way to give an intensity to the fact. So we're going to make it clear soon. But for now, we start with a pretty vanilla course on renormalization. Uh, there are several things named renormalization in mathematics and in physics. So who am I to say what it is and what it isn't renormalization? It's a very specific version that we're going to be talking about, sometimes called multi-scale renormalization. Uh, but I think it's better to explain what it is than to try to find a name that is unambiguous. So let's go. Let's first try to motivate. Uh, then we're going to really define what it is, like what is the tool that we're talking about, uh, make a very clear application with proofs and so on that should be uh, motivating enough and is to follow. And then we talk about some dependent cases, which is something more spicy. And maybe the first example we're going to do is kind of too silly. And people say, I know how to do better things without this renormalization stuff. So maybe the dependent case is going to uh, calm the unease of people who already know what we're going to be talking first. So why renormalization? So it's a technique that has some uh, good tracks, bad records in being too complicated, too difficult to follow. And it may be sometimes, but I definitely don't want to, to give this impression because that's not the impression I have while I work. So I want to make it very approachable, but it's very powerful. It's very good at making intuitive descriptions uh, rigorous. So sometimes you have a problem and you say, I don't know, these particles shouldn't have anywhere to go. They should get stuck here. But you know, maybe there are too many particles, then they can help each other and go somewhere. But this shouldn't happen because you should have a, you know, some protecting region. So you have an intuitive description in your mind, but it's very hard to make it rigorous. Randomization is a very good tool for that. And you can turn something that's in your, in your mind into a proof. And that's why I think Vladis Doravicius I uh, really loved this technique. He was a very intuitive mathematician. He would always come with, you know, uh, histories behind proofs. And he would use renormalization often to turn this into rigorous uh, proofs. And it's not only applied to percolation, like we're going to walk through in this course, but to many other models. I just chose percolation because it's a nice, uh, simple setup. And it's a pretty 
technique. So this should be enough for a course that something is pretty. But pretty is also very subjective. As I said, some people find it terrible, uh, ugly. So it's it's good that it's powerful besides being pretty because then it's a more objective reason to study. And why do we pick percolation? It's a simple model to study, uh, to define at least, but it also has its very nice open problems that are hard to tackle. So it lives in a, in a very sweet spot where you can introduce a model to anyone and get a challenge that are, uh, you know, long-standing open problems. Uh, also, it has a very beautiful physics uh, phenomena going on. So we're going to talk about the most basic ones, but there are much more deep physics going on inside percolation. And it's a good match which, with randomization. So that's probably the main reason we decided to pick it. Uh, so what is percolation? Uh, I remember I studied some pictures similar to this when I was a student in high school. It's the cycle of water. It evaporates, condensates, turns into clouds, rains, uh, goes through the soil, reach the water bed, and goes back to the ocean. And I remember they didn't use the word percolation in that uh, penetration of the water inside the soil, but it's really what it is. And I chose this picture because, you know, there are several phenomena going on there, like evaporation, condensation, even it's not written, but there is no ice there. So it's probably solidifying and melting. All of these phenomena can be tackled with some sort of randomization. You can understand a little bit about all of this using randomization. So it's percolation is just a piece of what is possible. And it's a piece we decided to pick. And it's this phenomenon of a liquid passing through uh, a solid. You can imagine a porous rock, for example, that let water through. So the model was introduced in 57 by Broadbent and Ramsley. It's a very simple model. We're going to define it now. It has since then been extensively studied, and it still has some very, very basic and difficult open questions. So what's the model? We are going to stick to Z2. So consider the planar lattice, which consists of uh, the Cartesian product of Z with Z, but with edges connecting all the sites uh, that have distance one between them. That's what we call nearest neighbor edges. Then you fix a parameter P between zero and one. That's going to give intuitively the porosity of your rock. And for every edge in your lattice, you open it with probability P and close it with probability one minus P independently of one node. So here you can see in blue a simulation of this process. It's a model for a random uh, porous medium. And we want to study in this random medium what uh, is the connectiveness of the medium. Of course, you can see there are some isolated edges there that don't connect to anything else. This will always happen because you know it's just you just need to get some bad luck and this will happen. Uh, but maybe there are some very large components, connected components there. We are interested actually in infinite ones. So, sorry. Uh, the event that we are interested in is the event. The origin is connected to infinity. So this is the notation we use. And it really is the event that you can find a path, an infinite self-avoiding path from the origin. Uh, and it has to go to infinity, right? It's an infinite path, self-avoiding. And the space is discrete. It has to go to infinity. And this event is measurable. It's not hard to see. And we're going to look at the probability of this event. And it's so important for us to give it the name theta of p, is the probability of zero being connected to infinity. And it's clearly a function of p. It's also not hard to show that it's monotone in p, monotone, non-decreasing. So if you increase p, more edges are open intuitively, should have a larger probability of connecting zero to infinity. And that's what it is. Um, if you study percolation in a traditional course, the first thing you do at this point of the theory is to use a counting path argument to show this dichotomy there, that for p small enough, you have theta of p equals zero. 
So there's no percolation. It's possible, impossible to find such a path from the origin to infinity. But as soon as P is close enough to one, uh, the probability to find this infinite path is positive. So there is some dichotomy there. And you can see that the function theta of P cannot be uh, analytic because it's zero in an interval from zero to some positive P. So it has a plateau and then it's positive. It's not analytic. Uh, and this is what physicists call a phase transition. You have a function that's very natural from a model that doesn't seem to break analyticity, you know, from the definition at least, but all of a sudden this uh, discontinuity of some derivative happens. Uh, we are going to prove the first line, sorry. So we're going to prove the first line, which is very easy. You probably saw this already if you follow the percolation course in your life. So this is not very groundbreaking, uh, but we're also going to prove a little bit more in this class. So stick around, if, even if you have already seen percolation somewhere, we're going to show a bit more. So if you plot the function theta, you're going to see, of course, have to do simulations for this. But if you do a large scale simulation, you're probably going to see something similar to this graph I'm picturing here. So it has a plateau uh, from zero. I don't think you can see my cursor, right? Yeah. So it has a plateau from zero to some value after which it abruptly starts to grow until it reaches one. So this point we implicitly define as the supremum where theta is zero is the critical point. It's where something very interesting should be happening, right? It was zero before and now it's suddenly not. Uh, PC for the lattice we just described is, was proved to be one half, exactly one half by a beautiful work of Kasten that is constructed on top of a work by Harris. So I showed you in the beginning a picture of Kasten and um, it's really a great example of you know a mathematician uh, taking a technique to a whole new level. So I was planning to to tell a bit more about Kasten, but I don't know if I know enough. He was uh, a source of inspiration for me. All the works from him I read uh, completely caught my imagination. He grew up in the Netherlands uh, during uh, the Second World War. He was of Jewish descent, so he was really a survival. Uh, he then migrated to the United States after the war. So during the war, he was harbored at um, a family, a non-Jewish family. It was very brave to host him. And we are lucky to have had him survive all this and be uh, very uh, profoundly impactful in mathematics. He did his PhD long after the war was over with Mark Kack. And he had great contributions in percolation, first passage percolation, uh, random walks, um, random walk in random environments, so you name it. He was very influential. And randomization is one of the examples I think he had the greatest impact. One proof that we're going to show here is basically inspired by a proof from him, but you know, the, the nicest things he did for randomization, we do not have time to address in this course. Um, I said that he proved PC equals one half for that lattice. He also proved that theta of P is continuous at P for the two dimensional case. This continuity of the function theta is one of the main open problems in percolation, perhaps the biggest one. It's still open for lattices of dimensions between three and 10. So for high dimensions, it used to be 19 and more, and now it's 11 and more, it keeps dropping. It was known by a work that was basically uh, developed in Vancouver. So uh, you guys there are probably more aware than me that the high dimensional case has been uh, tackled uh, by Harns Laid in a very uh, influential paper. So the reason why 10 is the number is really because you're trying to bound some functions and it gets easier and easier as the dimension grows. And you do what you do, you try to improve it to the best you can. And 10 is really a, a, 
a bound on how well you can do these calculations. Uh, if you were able to do a perfect calculation using the same technique, you could get up to six. But below that, it really is expected that the same technique cannot hold true because a different phenomenon is happening. So they say this is the critical dimension uh, that separates something very geometric where the fact that you are in a finite dimensional space plays a role. And after which dimension six and more, it starts to be uh, kind of infinite dimensions, dimensional. The critical uh, effects you see don't have loops. You don't see the fact that you are in finite dimension anymore. It's, it's kind of a sophisticated thing. It's uh, one of the great achievements of lace expansions, which is a technique also that is applied to other models. Um, and another question that is open is what is how theta of p behaves as p approaches the critical point. So you can see in that picture that it seems to approach it very abruptly. And indeed, it's proven for dimension two to uh, arrive at a certain polynomial with degree which is known for a certain lattice not known for the square lattice. And in dimensions high enough, again, 11 and more it's known to approach PC at a linear speed uh, because of uh, these techniques. So it's full of open questions and interesting problems. And the model is so um, general, you could change it in very different ways. For example, change the graph, make not a lattice, but something like a, something more similar to a social network, a graph that everyone can communicate with everyone. There's no geometry. So this is uh, full of dire directions to, to move. We are gonna stick to the classical case. So today we're gonna prove that there exists this critical value. It's not the critical value. There is this lower bound of the critical value, which is called PC, P0, between zero and one, such that below that, the probability to connect zero to infinity is zero. Actually, we're gonna prove something more quantitative that the probability that zero is connected to the boundary of a big ball of radius r, of radius n, decays as a stretched exponential uh, of n. So this uh, first result of the plateau of the function theta, and then the quantitative result we're gonna prove today. This, as I said, can be proved in a much shorter version than what we're gonna do today without using randomization. Um, so as I said, counting paths is a way to prove this, which is easier, gives better bounds, both on the value of P0 and on the decay. It gives exponential decay. So why are we bothering? So the reason is because randomization is much more robust, as we're going to see by the end of today's lecture still. So I want to, to insist. So even if you've seen the counting path argument, bear with me. So this is a skeleton of the proof. I split it into many steps, like five steps, even though it's not a complicated proof. So I, I over divided the proof into steps. So the first step is just to choose a sequence of scales. It's gonna be one line. Then we define what we call a bad event. Uh, then we prove that these events satisfy what I call a cascading property. We're gonna see what it means, but it's essentially like if this event happens in a big scale, it should happen in two smaller scales. So this is what we call the cascading property. Then from this, you can get recursive inequalities, which bounds the probability of these events in one scale in relation with the previous one. So it's a recursive thing. And then we do what we call triggering and we finish the proof. All these steps are small. I'm just over dividing them. Uh, and I put two comments there, which I find uh, interesting. The step B, which is to define the bad event, looks really simple, it's just a picture, but it's really the tricky one. After we see all the models, we start to see that, you know, this is where you should spend 90% of your energy. And this is what fascinates me about renormalization is that the nicest step is the step B and it's the one you spend most time with. So it's uh, what I like about it. All the other steps look easy. I mean, actually, only step D looks a little bit hard, but actually it's the simplest one. It's just algebra. It's going to occupy a full slide of calculations, but you know, you give to anyone who has 
basic algebra skills and they will be able to carry on. So really the uh, step that looks the easiest is the hardest and the one that looks the hardest is the easiest. So let's go. Step A, we choose scales. So for this proof, we're gonna choose the scales as a geometric growing sequence. So the scales are always gonna be called LK and it just chooses nine to the K, why not? And now I'm gonna introduce this notation MK, which is a, just a way to, to pick an index. So any element little m belonging to MK, it starts with the K, like the scale, and then uh, a point in Z2. So it's just a way to pair. If I give you little m, it's an index that tells you what scale you are and which point you are in Z2. And why do we use these indexes for? We use them to pave the lattice Z2, the plane, into boxes of side length LK. So a box is you know, a square. You are able to pave the whole plane with boxes like this. And they have side length LK, as I said, and they mimic a lattice Z2 again, right? If you think of each of these boxes as a new site, a renormalized site, as we call it, how do you index them? You pick a point in Z2 to tell which box you are, right? So we are always gonna be indexing these boxes with an index M. So we're gonna call the boxes D, uppercase D, uh, subscript M, which is the index. Having defined, um, yeah, we usually take the, the, the index to be LM. So the, the, the index is an integer, like right? three, seven. And the box we are talking about is usually LK times three, LK times seven. So just stretch the three, seven to get to the box we want. And we usually index it by the left bottom corner. So the box has a corner there and we add more LKs to the left and to the top. This is just a convention. It's not very important how we we index them. So the second step is to define the bad event. Okay, so this is gonna, as I said, look very easy. You take the box DM, it's the kernel there. And then you take DM tilde, which is just a three sized, three times wider box centered around the same center. And the event EM is the event that the small box is connected by an open path to the big box, the boundary of the big box. So this is, as I said, simple. And we are very interested in the uh, probability PK that uh, the event EM happens for some uh, M, sorry, the for some M is not inside the probability, otherwise it would be one. You take any box at scale K, PK is the probability that that event happens there. Since everything is translation invariant, this is not gonna change anything. So is there any question for now? So this is already kind of a proof, so. I, I have a question. Uh, the, the aim of the inside box is different from the outside box, right? So it's the same M. So when we talk about D tilde, then it's not indexed by the, so D tilde is really the larger one with the same uh, center as the M. Yeah, I okay. didn't define the M tilde, but it really is the stretched version. Okay, so the M that describes both box are the same. Yep. Okay, it's the Thank same you. index. Yeah. So more questions? So proofs have this uh, property that if you miss a step, you miss the next steps. So <laughs> please don't shy away from asking. So now we have the bad events. As I said, we should prove that it satisfied the cascading property. So the cascading property is really what makes choosing the event hard because you should choose an event that has this amazing property that if it happens in a big scale, it happens twice in the previous scale. So you can see there that we can pave 
the boundary of the small box. So imagine that we are at scale k plus one, right? So the scale k plus one is nine times bigger than the scale k. So it means that if we want to pave the boundary of the small box with little boxes, we are going to spend 11 of them times, you know, it's probably 10 times four, it's uh, 40 boxes to pave the inner ring there. And then we also pave the outer ring, which I don't know, you spend some boxes there, it's a constant. And if you have a connection, an open path from dm to dm tilde, that's k k plus one, you can see, you know, proof by picture, but you can turn this proof rigorous without much of a trouble, that you have a, a box that you can choose in the scale k, like the previous scale, inside the inner ring and one in the outer ring, so that the events em1 and em2 are going to happen there. So a way to write this rigorously is em, like it's written there, is contained in a union. You know, we have to pick the indexes of the union to be the inner ring and the outer ring. So M1 in the inner ring, M2 in the outer ring of the intersection. EM1 intersected with EM2. So this by the union bound gives you a bound on uh, PK plus one with respect to PK. So this is what I called in the slides before the recursive inequality. So we are bounding PK plus one as a function of PK. And you see that it's very relevant that you see got a big constant there. 27 to the four is an exaggerated constant of how many ways you have to pick these two small boxes. So you have an entropic factor, which is a constant times the previous thing squared. Now, unhappily, my, my setup is terrible today. I don't have a pen to draw. But if you think of the function that takes a number, squares it, and multiplies by a big constant, right? f of x is 27 to the 4 x squared. Close to the origin, this function looks like a parabola. It is a parabola. <laughs> and it, it has derivative 0 at the origin. So if you've studied dynamical systems, you see that iterating this function, it goes to zero. If you start close to zero, you go to zero very fast because zero is a strong attractor to this dynamical system. Okay, if you haven't seen dynamical systems, we are gonna prove this now, so don't worry. So let's prove this. We're gonna prove that PK decays as a stretched exponential of the size of the box. So for every uh, K, pk is more or equal than exponential of minus lk to a small power, one tenth. And you're going to prove this, you know, by induction. We're going to use induction all the time in renormalization. It's the core of renormalization. So how to prove something by induction? You get to choose if you do the zero first and then the induction step. But in renormalization, we almost always start with the induction step and then we do the first value. So how does this induction step can be written? So we have written several papers <laughs> using the same idea. And the idea to write it as such came like five years after I was already writing this the bad way. <laughs> so this is the right way. Don't try another way. <laughs> so you take PK plus one and divide by what you expect it to be smaller than, right? PK plus one over the bound you want on PK plus one. All you have to do is show this smaller or equal to one. This is the right way to do it. <laughs> so first thing we're gonna do is to bound PK plus one using the cascading property we have. So it's bounded by a big constant times PK squared. Now we are gonna use the induction hypothesis. We already proved that PK is smaller than exponential blah, blah, blah. Right, we're just proving that this implies this, the result in this KK plus one. So replace PK by exponential minus something. Now you see there are two things competing. The thing the denominator is terrible because it's an exponential of something minus, or exponential of minus something big. So it's gonna go to the numerator as a growing thing. 
And there is the thing that's helping you, it's the exponential of minus, which is in the numerator. This is the k. And all you want is for the thing in the numerator to beat the thing in the denominator. So we bring all of them to the same exponential. And you see that one of them is 2LK to the 0 0.1. The 2 comes from the fact that PK is squared. And the other one is LK plus 1 to the 0 0.1. So it's a fight between two, 2 in the smaller scale and 1 in the bigger scale. So you remember the bigger scale is 0 it's nine times bigger. So you put this nine outside to the power 0 0.1. And nine to the 0 0.1 is smaller than two. It's approximately 1.24. So they lost the fight. This is smaller or equal to one. Hold on there. Is it only for K large enough, right? We only understood the large asymptotic be behavior. Like for large K, this goes to zero very fast. So for k larger equal than k0, this is more equal to 1. Okay, so this is the slide that I told you is, looks very complicated. And it's not. It's just a calculation. Uh, but what we have to understand from this is that this is not really the typical induction, where you start from 0 and go. We're going to say that it works from some k0 on. Right? So there is some k0 large that if you prove the result for K0, you proved it elsewhere uh, for all the other Ks larger than that, right? So we're not gonna start at zero, we're gonna start at K0. So the last step in induction is to prove the thing for the first member of the induction, K0. And that's what we called in the slides, first slides, triggering, which is a fancy name for prove the first step of the induction. So we still need to prove that for some k larger than k0, think k0, right? pk0 is smaller than what it's expected to be, exponential minus lk0 to 0 0.1. How do we do this? I mean, it's a big fixed box, right? We want to show that the small kernel is connected to the boundary of the big kernel with a small probability. Um, the question disappeared. Uh, is about the last slide because th so there they what we have to prove is that for some fixed k but it cannot be zero for example or two it has to be large so that the last slide already worked right so we want this to already be working so you need k larger than k zero so if for some k larger than k zero we prove that equation the top there uh, the bound then we proved it for every scale after all so we fix some k just imagine k0 if you can prove that pk0 is smaller than exponential minus lk0 to the 0 0.1 you have proved it for larger k's as well because the induction works is it clear mm -hmm. Yes, maybe it's just a small detail, but the, the first inequality, the induction, the induction is for k greater than zero or k greater than k zero. K zero. So there is a typo. Uh, in the previous slide? Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, true. We are not going to prove it for every k larger than k zero. It's true. The equation, the bound we want is for every k large enough. Thank you. Okay, so so we need to prove this just for k large and for for some k zero. We do something else. Yeah, we we are not going to prove it for every k bigger or equal to zero. We're going to prove it for every k bigger or equal than k zero. Thank you. So you can, for k0, this is just a box, right? And for this fixed box, uh, the function probability of the bad event is a continuous function. It's actually a polynomial. So if you choose p is equal to 0, the probability is 0. So if you choose it close enough to 0, it's close enough to 0. It's just something you have to, you know, just have to pick p small enough 
So this is a big secret of when to start trying renormalization. Usually if you have one parameter that you can make as large or as small as you want, this type of renormalization is very powerful. So this is what we call perturbative renormalization. So it's when you're dealing with very small values of P or, very, or values of P very close to one also work. So this is um, perturbative renormalization, but renormalization is also useful when you're not doing something perturbative like here. Okay, so what's the conclusion? We wanted to bound the probability that zero is connected to infinity. If zero is connected to infinity and you fix a box containing the origin, then the box is connected to the boundary of this box tilde, right? The path is going to infinity. It has to go through the big box. So the, we can bound the probability that zero is connected to infinity by, the, by PK. For any k. And we know that pk is bounded by this exponential at least for k larger than k0. So this goes to zero with k. Not only it goes to zero, but we have a quantitative bound on how fast it goes to zero. Okay, so I know that you've seen easier proofs of this with better bounds and everything, but what are the advantages? So First of all, this is something that works for percolation, but also works for other models. We have to change the event. Sometimes we have to change the scales, uh, but it's, it's flexible. It gives you quantitative results. Uh, other methods sometimes also give you quantitative results, but also methods, especially the ones using uh, ergodicity, they don't give you uh, quantitative results. They just say something, you know, is constant almost everywhere and you prove it's zero, so it's, it's zero, but uh, it doesn't give you, for example, rates of decays when you're dealing with ergodicity arguments or, uh, you know, subadditive ergodic theorems. Uh, they are robust to changes to the model. So if you change the lattice instead of the square lattice, you put some diagonals or you change something, you see that you almost didn't talk about the lattice here, right? Just do some boxes, <laughs> that's it. So it's very robust to microscopic changes to the model. It's also very, so very robust. Uh, what do you mean? Uh, the last inequality in the conclusion there. So it's uh, the, the probability that BLK is connected to the boundary of three BLK. I didn't define this properly. But it's exactly the the bad event E M. So it's uh, I didn't define this properly, but it's exactly P K. So what is three B L K? I didn't define this, but imagine you're stretching in all directions, <laughs> making three three times larger box, but with the same center of gravity. Uh, this technique is also very robust to dependencies in the model. And this is perhaps the, the nicest advantage. And I'm going to, it's so nice that I'm going to redo this whole proof, assuming that the model is dependent. And that's where you start to, to see the big advantage. And another not trivial at all advantage of this is if you look at the triggering, this is, this is very subtle, but very important. If you look at equation three, you see that we need to prove that for some k, pk is smaller than this, right? So this um, we did by brute forcing p, right? We choose p very close to zero and that's it. But you can massage this and make it into an implicit assumption. And this implicit assumption is what people often call, oftentimes call finite size criteria. So just instead of trying to, in, in your counting path, to say like, oh, if the probability to cross an edge is more than one quarter, blah, blah, blah. Uh, here we are doing something different. You're just saying, look at the box. If the probability that something happens inside the box is more than epsilon, I can continue. What's the advantage of making this implicit hypothesis to your induction? 
is that when you negate this, you say, no, no, it, I cannot work. So it's not true that the crossing event has probability smaller than epsilon. So it means for every scale, you have a positive probability of crossing. So this is something you can work with. So negating that you can trigger is a tool that you can use. And that's why renormalization becomes actually useful when you're studying non-perturbative situations. So even close to PC, you have a big advantage of using renormalization because you negate three. You say, I can never find a box that crosses, blah, blah, blah. So that means something weird is happening. So we can use this weird thing as a building block. I'm not going to do this. It's a, another direction this course could have taken. But it's behind the proof that PC is one half by casting. And it's behind several other beautiful results that deal with uh, close to criticality. So there's this. And now we move to, to, this, to the review, uh, review of the proof. But first, is, uh, is there any question? Great, so we first chose scales. Then we defined what we call a bad event. We showed that it relates between scales and use this to prove a recursive inequality. And then we showed that it, something happens in the first scale it propagates. Now we're gonna follow the same steps again with a different model to show that we can prove things that we cannot prove with counting paths. So this is gonna be a weird model, <laughs> just because it fits well this short time we have. So imagine that you have the lattice Z2, <laughs> but instead of opening closing edges independently, we are gonna do it in a dependent way. We first pick centers of balls in the whole plane according to a Poisson point process, okay? So imagine you have a, uh, the floor after a rainy day, just uh, these little droplets around the floor. But each drop will start to grow to a random radius. So this radii are I, are I, I, D. Yeah, the intensity of the, the point process is just Lebesgue. But the, to each point, we associate a random radius, R, I which has this polynomial tails, the probability that Ri is bigger than R, the case like R to the minus 20. So it's, it's very short tailed, but not exponentially or something crazy like this. It's polynomial with a high degree. So it has all the moments until 20, then it stops having moments. Um, so what we add to this lattice, we want to build a graph, right? Is all the edges that are inside some ball with center in the Poisson point process and radius Ri. So you see a picture there, <laughs> right? So we make these balls and all these balls have, uh, whenever you are inside the ball, you can walk. You cannot walk in the dry region. What's the probability that the origin is connected to infinity, right? So it could be that the big, the big balls really help you on the way to infinity, right? You just have to walk a little bit and then you find the big ball. Now you have a lot of breathing room to find another even bigger ball. And maybe it's much easier to go to infinity using these large balls. Uh, the catch here is the counting paths argument doesn't work here. The counting paths is very nice for ID percolation. Here it falls completely. So this is a dependent percolation. And although it's dependent and nasty, it satisfies a very nice uh, the coupling inequality, I'm not going to prove it, but it's easy to prove that if you pick two balls, two boxes, sorry, A and B, that have side length L and inner distance L to a small power, uh, power is slightly bigger than one, say one and a half, what happens inside these two boxes is roughly independent. So the probability of an event that's based on the box one, say A, intersected with B, that is based on the box B is bounded by the product plus some fast decaying error, right? So this is the type of thing you can prove about models without talking about percolation, just, you know, bound your ball. What's the probability that one big ball touches these two boxes 
when you do these bounds and you get it, this type of decoupling. It's a quantitative idea of mixing. If you have seen mixing as a concept, this is a, not mixing of Markov chains, which are, although it's very related, mixing of uh, random environments. It's a quantitative version of mixing. So suppose you can prove this for a reason or another, or even forget the model is given by balls. From now on, we just use this, just a model that decouples like this. Okay, forget the artificial model I gave above. So what we can we prove? So first we choose scales, but we're gonna change slightly the scales because we don't want the boxes to be close by with relation to their radii, right? If we go back to the previous proof, these boxes uh, were side length L and distance, I don't know, nine L. So it was not really uh, much further than their radius. The distance was pro proportion, yeah, A and B are arbitrary here. Sometimes you can only get proofs from mono, uh, bounds like this for monotonally increasing events, but here it, it, they're arbitrary. So here the radius and the distance of the box is of the same order. So you can't, we can't choose this and hope to use the inequality we have here, right? So let's choose a different set of scales. And as I said, randomization is so flexible. You can choose everything and it just works. So now the next scale, LK plus one, is the previous scale not times nine as before, but to a power 1.5. So you can choose the power there. Just be careful if you choose powers bigger than two, then this doesn't work anymore. So I said it always, it always works, but it's not true. And then we pave the universe with these boxes, just like before. We define the back, bad event. You see the picture there, everything in gray is just as before. The event is just as before. So you can see that if the event happens, it happens also in the previous scale, right? Uh, but now the previous scale is LK, but the distance, as you can see in red, is LK to 1.5. So they're much further apart than their radius. So you can use that inequality. So how do we bound PK plus one? As before, PK plus one, is bounded by how many ways you can choose the two boxes in the inner ring and the outer ring. So this is, you know, it's much bigger now. Before it used to be a constant, 27 to the four. Now it's three times LK plus one over LK to the four, which is not, you know, 27 anymore. It's something growing with K. And after you chose the two boxes, fix them, what's the probability you are dealing with. The probability that the event happens in M1 and in M2. So it's a probability of an intersection, right? So this is the perfect scenario to use our decoupling inequality. The probability of an intersection is bounded by the product of the probabilities, which is PK squared, plus the distance to the minus 10. So this is, you see exactly the the coupling inequality we had. So instead of bounding PK plus one by a constant times PK squared, which is what we had before, we're bounding it by a growing number, three to the four times LK to the two times, not PK squared, but PK squared plus an error term. And you can play around with all these constants to, to get better results. This is very far from optimal. I'm just doing something that works hopefully, and you can massage this to get better results. They get very sharp, by the way. So this is the bound you have. And you know, that that's the part that looks hard and it's easy. You, What we want to prove now is not a stretched exponential decay on PK. This is impossible. Why? Because there is a polynomial probability that you just cover your whole box with a big ball. Right? What's the probability to find a gigantic ball that poof, covers your whole box and you can go anywhere you want? I mean, it's the radius of the box to the minus 20. But it's not nothing, right? It's, it's not stretched exponentially small. It's polynomial. So we're going to give a polynomial bound on PK. 
pk is smaller or equal than lk to the minus 8. Now you do what I told you to do, pk plus 1 over what we want pk plus 1 to be smaller than. And then you use the cascading property, replace pk plus 1 by the bound we have. Then you put everything in the numerator, you make all these exponents fight, and you see that 15 is bigger than 14. <laughs> so for k large enough, this induction is working. So unless I did some miscalculation there, these choices of scales and exponents and decays work. And you can get them much better than this if you're careful. So now what we have to do is to uh, show that for k0, oh, sorry, oh, what did I do? I jumped to the last slide, sorry. Again, oh, wrong command. Oh, no, no, I see what I'm doing. It's because I was selecting the, the index, not the slide. Okay, I'm almost over. Sorry for holding you for so long. So now we choose the intensity of the Poisson point process small. Remember, we need a parameter to drive to zero. So we choose the intensity of the rain. If it's small enough, then PK zero is smaller than, not exponential, sorry, this is a typo. Then uh, LK zero to the minus eight. So the induction works and it's a very important observation that you remember we had the dependence bound on what happens between two boxes, the event A and B. That should be uniform on U, or at least for U, U small. Because if that was not uniform, then uh, you wouldn't be able to choose U small in the last step, right? You already used the decoupling inequality before. So you cannot do this unless you can do this, which is the uniform you need to exchange these two limits. So the conclusion is that the probability to connect to infinity is bounded by PK for every K and PK is more or equal than LK to the minus eight, at least for K larger than K zero. So it also goes to zero. And finally, something you cannot prove with counting paths. So thank you very much. Uh, it's great that we have a uh, possibility to do a virtual meeting, but of course it would be nicer to be together either here in Belo Horizonte, where I am right now, or there in Vancouver. So thank you so much. Uh, thanks to you. Um, if anyone wants to uh, clap and open their mix, uh, mics, you're welcome to do it. Uh, now we're going to post the questions and we usually stop recording so everybody can feel free to ask whatever comes to their minds. <laughs>